this topic as a whole. You know, we have to remember that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he encouraged us to have children. So having children is a sunnah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, you know, have as many children as you can, for I will be proud of your number on the Day of Judgment. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will boast about the number of Muslims on the Day of Judgment. Now obviously, this ummah is the largest ummah of believers on the Day of Judgment, out of all of the nations of the Prophets. This ummah will be the largest of them all. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi encouraged us. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi talked about being proud of us on the Day of Judgment, you know, the number that we have. Um, obviously, from the individual perspective, from the virtues of having children, is that it is the greatest investment that you can make. As we know, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that, he said to a person, a son, when he was referring to his father, the son was asking his, you know, was asking the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what belongs to my parents? And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Anta wa maluka li abik al waladu kasbu abi. You and what you've earned belong to your father, and obviously to both of your parents, but it was in the context of the father at that moment. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the child is the earning of his parent. Right? It, you know, SubhanAllah, you work so hard, you toil to raise this child. And because of that, everything that that child does goes to your record. And in fact, all of the actions that the Prophet ﷺ continue af said continue after we die, being sadaqa jariya, a continuous charity, a righteous child to make dua for us, or a beneficial knowledge, all of them are found within a, ch within a child. Because for the most part, who's going to make dua for you consistently other than your child? Who's going to give charity on your behalf consistently other than your child? Who's going to spread your beneficial knowledge consistently other than your child? So it's really, you know, it's, it's a worthy investment. And not only that, but in Nawawi rahimahullah, he comments on this beautiful hadith. He says that not only is this limited to the child, but to the entire offspring, right? So can you imagine that our great, 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 great grandparents, if they were Muslim and they taught their children how to pray, who taught their children how to pray, who taught their children how to pray, and who taught them la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and the importance of being Muslim. There could be someone hundreds of, you know, that passed away hundreds of years ago that's benefiting from you being here right now for being in a gathering of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the investment continues for a long line and we continue to be a part of the legacy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is part of the good deeds of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Ismail alayhi salam so much. Imagine him and his brother Ishaq alayhi salam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah has chosen from the children of Ibrahim, Ismail. Right? Ismail has a higher level than Ishaq. But if you look under Ishaq, you have so many prophets. All of the prophets of Bani Israel. Because Ya'qub alayhi salam is the son of Ishaq, you have the 12, the 12 sons of Ya'qub, and you have all of the 12 tribes of Israel, and all of the prophets that came from that. And with Ismail you have this long line going just to the Prophet And from Muhammad there is a continuous legacy. So when you invest in something like this, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, it's something that, that will benefit you, not just with your children, but inshallah ta'ala with your grandchildren and their children and so on so forth. So there's the investment aspect of it, and there's also the aspect of struggle. As Muslims, we like to struggle for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards struggle. We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards pain. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He, you know, he, he talks about the mother in particular. حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا حَمَلَتْهُ كُرْهَا وَوَضَعَتْهُ كُرْهَا Allah describes labor pains. Allah describes the pain at the time of delivery. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the way that the mother would scream, you know, whenever she's delivering. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is expressing this to show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not unaware of your struggle. And the struggle of the parents as a whole, obviously. As Rasulullah said that there is no form of anxiety, nor fo no form of distress. No form of harm, no form of disease, except that when the believer is struck by it, it expiates a sin. It takes away his sins. So it purifies us. And we know from the famous hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and some say it's marfu' to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he was asked, 
by a man who carried his mother on his back throughout Hajj. You know, back in those days, before you had the cooling tiles, before you had all of, you know, uh, the, the things that are sprinkling, you know, uh, moisture and things of that sort, before you had all of that, and the five-star hotels that are around, you know, the Kaaba that look like Gotham City, you know, before all of that happened, he was carrying his mother on his back with his feet burning, you know, in, in the heat throughout the entire manasik of Hajj. And he asks, have I repaid her? You know, have I given her, you know, what, what, what I was, have I given her her due? And the answer was, وَلَا بِطَلْقَةٍ وَاحِدًا Not even with one cry at the time of labor. You haven't even repaid her for that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who compensates the believer on the Day of Judgment. So there's from that aspect also, and Rasulullah particularly talking about a woman in her time of pregnancy. Now brothers, we're going to also talk about brothers also, but particularly the mother, because the mother struggles the most. Um, you know, there's an authentic hadith from Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-mar'atu min hamliha ila wiladiha ila fitamiha, that verily a woman from her pregnancy to the time of her delivery to the time of her weaning, فِي حَالَةِ جِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ She is in a state of jihad fi sabil Allah. She is a, a soldier for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout that entire process. You know, throughout that entire process. And that's why Rasulullah sallallahu said, if a woman dies before labor, and this is an authentic hadith in Ahmad, if a woman dies before labor, during labor, or during the nifas, she would have died shaheed, she would have died a martyr and her child will drag her to paradise even by the umbilical cord. She will enter Jannah, she would die a martyr. SubhanAllah, so that's, you know, that's an amazing situation to be in. Obviously it's one that uh, requires you know, much effort and much struggle, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is surely not unaware. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also expressed that. Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah also said something very beautiful and, in, he, and interesting. He said that, and our companions, meaning the scholars, they all used to say that a woman's dua is mustajab at this time, is accepted at this time. You know, because with the, with the greater struggle, the more the dua is accepted. The closer that person is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as they struggle. Then there is the reward of sacrificing for your children. Right? We all make sacrifices for our children, brother and sister. And just listen to this beautiful hadith from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha in Sahih Muslim, where Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says that a poor woman came to me with her two daughters, and I gave her three dates. And she gave each of them a date, and she was about to eat the third one. And then when one of her daughters asked for it, she took that date and she divided it into two and she gave it to her two daughters. So she went hungry while her daughters ate. Now, how many times did we, did we sacrifice for our children? You know, there was something that we wanted to do, there was something that we wanted to eat, but as soon as our children put their eyes on it, that was it, right? It belonged to them. And so Aisha radiallahu anha, she was amazed by this. So she, she told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about what she saw. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, حَقَّتْ لَهَا الْجَنَّةِ بِهَذِهِ التَّمْرَةِ Jannah became her right. SubhanAllah, just as the food was the right of the child when, they looked, when, when the child looked at the food, Jannah became her right because of that date, because of that one date. So even the sacrifices that you make for your children on a daily basis, especially when they're, when they're at a younger age, you know, the happiness that you would forego sometimes, you know, the, the time that you would rather spend in something else, but the time you sacrifice for them. Don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unaware from that. And that's whether the child is righteous or not. Notice Rasulullah didn't talk about whether these two daughters grow up to be you know, pious Muslims or things of that sort. That's just the sacrifice that every parent will make. Now, if they are righteous, then it goes even further. right? If they are righteous, then it goes even further because then they're your continuous investment. As we said, everything you taught them, the salah that you taught them, it's like someone is praying, it's like someone is praying for you every single time, right? You are getting the reward of that. Every time they say the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any ibadah, it is your reward. And it benefits you after death, um, all the way through, you know, through your grandchildren and so on and so forth. Now, the, the point here is that at what point do you start trying to make your children righteous? And that's the, that's the issue here. 
Now there is a reward whether you raise your children righteous or not from the very beginning, the sacrifices you make as parents. There is a reward for that. But at what point do you start caring about the righteousness of your children? And that's really something that I wanted to start out with to introduce this topic in the first place because that's the point of all this. Learning the sunnahs and things of that sort and learning the fiqh. All of this is to do things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to have the maximum blessing from this, from this effort and from what we go through. Um, and a lot of times people, again, they wait until their children grow up to start worrying about their righteousness, right? And then take him to a shaykh and hope he'll give him the Holy Spirit. You know, put his hand on his head and then all of a sudden he'll start loving salah and he'll start loving the masjid and, you know, she'll want to wear not just hijab, she'll want to wear niqab, you know, because she got the Holy Spirit one time, you know, one meeting and alhamdulillah it's all over. And that's, that's such a, a wrong way of thinking. You know, obviously it doesn't make sense. And as much as it doesn't make sense, you know, I've said this in conventions with, with thousands of people. I made that remark and some of the parents are laughing and I'm like, you're guilty of this, you know. I can see you right now. I know what your kids do, you know. You're guilty of this right now. So it's, uh, although, you know, it, it's illogical and it doesn't make sense, un unfortunately some people only react when it comes back to hit them in the face, you know whenever they see the consequences of their actions. Some people are not proactive, some people are reactive. They wait until their children grow up and their children are telling them to, you know, to, you know saying bad words to them and telling them to go away and, and shutting the door on them and not giving them the time of day and then questioning Islam and so on and so forth. That's when some parents are like, wow, what have I done with my life? And we should not wait for that time. And you know, that's, there's a lot of perspective on the hadith, for example, where the Messenger وسلم, said, to raise your children on salah at seven. Make sure your kids are praying at seven. Not just one or two prayers a day. Make sure that they're praying the five daily prayers at seven. Fajr counts too, even on the weekends. At seven years old, your children should be praying. And Rasulullah said what? And at the age of 10, then you need to discipline them physically. The Prophet was not, giving, was not telling the Sahaba, you know, if your kids aren't praying at 10 years old, go smack them around. Actually, the perspective of this hadith is that a lot of people react with the hand in the first place, right? They start slapping right away when their kids aren't praying. You know, that's the way that they start, they start disciplining physically from the first place. And what the Messenger وسلم, is teaching us that if for three years, three entire years, every single day, you are ensuring that your children are praying just like you, do you really think that would be necessary at the age of 10? No. Okay, so you start early. And how early do you start? When do you start trying to ensure righteous children? When? After pregnancy. Before pregnancy. <laughs> when? Which du'a? Before marriage too. Before that too. <laughs> You ensure, you try to ensure the righteousness of your children even before marriage. The Prophet ﷺ taught us, or Allah Azzawajal teaches us, Ibrahim salam's dua, and Rasulullah ﷺ used to make this dua, and he taught us to make this dua. رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامَا O oh Allah, grant us from our spouses and our offspring the coolness of our eyes, and make us imams for the muttaqeen, make us leaders of the muttaqeen. So there is that. And you know what else? The way that you treat your parents. That's also a way of ensuring the righteousness of your kids because what goes around comes around. SubhanAllah, the, you know, I see some of the things that, that my daughter does to me. I'm like, you know, I remember making that same joke or pulling that same thing with my parents. And she's just three and she's already doing this. All right, some of the things that, that um, my Sunday school kids, before I became imam, my Sunday school students used to do to me. I would say, SubhanAllah, I remember playing that same prank when I was in Sunday school. You know, it, it comes back around. SubhanAllah, it does come back around. So the way that you treat your parents, the way that you treat your parents, now obviously there are exceptions to that. There are exceptions to that. But generally speaking, you will see some of it if you look close enough in the way that you treated your parents, that your children will treat you in the same way. Uh, then, getting married, choosing the right spouse, like some of you talked about. A man came to Ibrahim Adham Rahimahullah, four-month-old baby, you know, bringing him to the greatest shaykh of the time, right? Go ahead, make dua for him. You know, smack him on the head. Whatever it is that you have to do, make him a righteous boy. Rahim al Adham said, it's too late. So what do you mean it's too late? He said, you should have came to me before you got married. Right? Before you got married. Because the type of spouse that you marry, Bismillah. The type of spouse that you marry, 
will have a lot to do with your children. Now, we, we really underestimate that. And unfortunately, a lot of times, when we're young in particular, we get married for the wrong reasons, or we rush to get married, or we, or we marry the person that excites us most. But we don't realize that this is a contract that you're going to have to deal with. This is the most important decision that you're going to make in your life after your religion. Right? Because it will, you know, subhanAllah, and it's not just a wife, it's a husband too. Having a righteous spouse. When you marry someone who you, who you think is going to be a good father, a good mother, and you think about that before you get married, right? You can't keep trying, you can't just always try to patch things up afterwards. So looking for those good characteristics, those, and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Bayhaqi Rahimahullah, he commented on that one. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِذَا أَتَاكَ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ if a person comes to you with good religion and good character. He said one of the reasons why the Prophet ﷺ told us we should look for character too is because we should want our children to have good character. So I should see things in my prospective spouse that I would like my children to have. The characteristics, I should want my child to have those same attributes and those same characteristics before I get married. Then what comes after that, after choosing the spouse? Even at the time of intimacy, the Prophet ﷺ taught us a dua. Before being intimate every time, Rasulullah said that both of the spouses actually, the husband and the wife should make dua, Allahumma jannib shaytan wa jannib huma razaqtana. Oh Allah, put the shaytan aside and put him away from anything that you give us as a result of this, any of our offspring. Right? So again, we have Rasulullah teaching us, even at that moment, you're conscious, you're awake, you're thinking of that. You're thinking of your children, right? Because the Muslim, the believer is always proactive. He's always thinking about his future, right? He's, he, he knows the more he does now, the more he'll thank himself later, right? So you, you're making that dua from the very start. And by the way, just to, so you all know, I'm going to be very explicit, especially when we get into fiqhi issues. So please forgive me from now.